Awesome, thank you. So these are my disclosures. So we're gonna talk about a background on my senior gravis. So let's start with a story. So here we have Bill. He looks kind of cranky up there, but he's a pretty nice, happy guy. He's 45, he's married, he's got two kids. He's at his job, had a little bit of a tough meeting, so that's why he kind of looks a little upset there. And then all of a sudden, he starts to notice some double vision. Looks at his hand, sees double, and then one of his colleagues comes up to him and says, hey Bill, I kind of noticed that your left eye is drooping. So as would be expected, Bill is a little bit stressed out. He makes an appointment with his primary care doctor and goes to the primary care doctor. And so here, the story might diverge. You know, uh, Bill may have gone to the urgent care or have gone to the emergency room or maybe had gone to the optometrist. But lucky for Bill, his primary care doctor is pretty astute, recognizes the common signs and is concerned about myasthenia. So she tells him, go to the second floor, get some blood work. And about a week or two later, he gets a phone call and his doctor tells him, hey Bill, you have myasthenia gravis. I'm gonna refer you to neurologist. And of course, Bill has never heard of MG. So what is MG? So as I was watching the talks this morning, it was kind of cool because there are many aspects of the morning talks that are part of my small background MG talk. So I thought let's take a step back and think about how we as doctors think about disease or human illness. So when we learn about pathology or diseases in medical school, we group them into different categories. And some of them are very common, things that everyone is very familiar with, and some are a little bit more rare. So let's kind of walk through that path a little bit. So one disease state is trauma. Right, so everyone's familiar with that. You get into a car accident, maybe you fall down. And I guess we can take a step back and say, well, why is it important to think about disease that way? And the reason why it's important, and this was mentioned this morning, is that we have to know the cause or the group of disease so we can think about treating it. You wouldn't treat one set of diseases the same as you would treat another. So if you're in a bad car accident, you're rushed to the emergency room and doctors will stabilize you, give you fluids, maybe do surgery. The other common one is infection. This one is nice because you can get cured, right? So we, you have an infection, we figure out the cause of the infection, what bacteria, what virus, COVID pandemic, and then we're able to treat it. Also hereditary. So this maybe you're a little bit less familiar with. So Dr. Day did a beautiful talk this morning, kind of going into hereditary diseases. Now the treatment's gonna be different from the other two that we just discussed, because if it's hereditary, we have to fix the genetic mutation or the toxic protein that that mutation leads to. We have cancer, so we all, are all familiar with cancer. So cancer is a cell that in our body that refuses to die. So it keeps replicating and taking up the resources of our body. We have neurodegenerative, so a little bit more rare. So these are a group of diseases where there's a toxic buildup of protein and the part of our nervous system starts to degenerate. So common diseases in this class you may have heard of are Alzheimer's disease, where you lose your memory neurons, or ALS, where you lose your motor neurons. And the last one, the one relevant to all the diseases that we're gonna be talking about today is autoimmune. So we have this robust immune system, which is very complicated. You've got T cells and B cells and antibodies and complement, all these sort of words you have been hearing in the morning, you'll be hearing about more today. But the role of our immune system is to fight pathogens or bad guys, right? So what happens in autoimmune diseases that is there a dis, there's a dysregulation. Something is off or the body starts to attack itself. And this is what is happening in my senior gravis. So the good guys, the army that's supposed to be fighting the bad guys actually starts to fight itself. 
And if you understand that, then you know, okay, well, for me to fix my disease, I guess I have to suppress my immune system. And that's where the therapies part of our morning session or afternoon session will come in. So MG is a rare disease, right? So we think maybe 60 to 70,000 patients in the US. Um, the prevalence is growing as we diagnose it more because we're more aware of the disease and also because the patients are living longer. It can really come on at any age. So we say most commonly it's 30s for women, 50s for men, but you can have childhood onset MG, which we call juvenile onset. You can have late onset, which comes on after 50 or very late onset after 65. It's not uncommon in my clinic for an 80 year old to present with new onset MG. So we see this. Why, why do I get it, right? Dr. Mupidi talked about it in this talk in his talk in the morning we don't know I, I that's really one of the biggest questions patients want to know why me why now right and we're not able to answer that with mg there is an association with the thymus so this is a gland that lives on your chest uh, behind your chest wall and it's really important in developing immunity as a kid but when you get older it kind of becomes strong and goes away but patients with MG, about 10% actually have a cancer in that area, and another 60% can have it be enlarged or more active. And it's important to know that the main symptom of myasthenia, based on how and where it causes disease, is muscle weakness and fatigue. So patients with MG don't have numbness, they don't have tingling, they don't have pain as a direct cause of the disease, they don't have cognitive issues. So it's weakness and fatigue. So here I have the symptoms of Mycena gravis. We can separate it into ocular and generalized. So thinking back at Bill, he's at work, looks at his hands, he sees double. So majority of MG patients at onset and when they come to the doctor will have double vision or droopy eyelids. But over time, 85% of them will have generalized symptoms. So it's going to move to the muscles of the facial area, which we call bulbar. So speaking, swallowing, breathing, even neck weakness, breathing issues, chewing issues. And then they can also have arm and leg weakness. And this tends to be proximal, so trouble raising arms, trouble getting up from a chair. And here we have the separations, so if you take all of MG, only about 15% remains restricted to the eyes and the rest of, it, of the patients have generalized disease. So now I'm gonna go into physiology and pathophysiology. And you guys come with me on this journey. I'm gonna try to use some analogies, but I may be missing the ball here, so you guys let me know. So Dr. Day this morning, uh, did a cartoon of the nervous system. And so here we have the brain, right? And that connects to the spinal cord and then the spinal cord connects to the muscle. So if we zoom in on the nerve and muscle connection, I have my own cartoon. So from the spinal cord, we have the neuron, which is the red big dot. And then we have the nerve. So the signal goes down the nerve. And at the nerve endings, you have release of acetylcholine, which then combines to the receptor on the muscle, which are the yellow uh, Ys. And that leads to muscle contraction. And so thinking about an analogy, we can think about the acetylcholine as a key. And that key unlocks the door, which is the receptor, which allows a bunch of people, which is a current, to come in the muscle, which leads to muscle contraction. And the reason why we're going to get into the nitty gritty of this is, again, just setting a foundation. So then what Dr. Kang is talking about therapies, you have a mental picture of how things are working, how things are abnormally working in MG, and what we can do to fix it. 
So here we get a bit more granular looking at the neuromuscular junction. So I'm going to try to use this arrow here. So here we have the nerve, acetylcholine, and the muscle, and then we have it highlighted here. So the signal comes down, acetylcholine is released, and on the muscle membrane, we have the receptors, those little Ys from the figure before. So what I want to add to that are there are some proteins on the muscle membrane called LRP4 and musk, and what they do is they cluster the receptors. So you, you think about that big crowd of people trying to get through the door, because these doors are all close to each other, then when the doors open, all of those people can get in. So it improves the efficiency of the signal so that the muscle can contract. And then lastly, we have acetylcholinesterase. So we don't want the doors to be open all the time or else our muscles will always be contracted and we can't relax. So this is like a Pac-Man that eats up the acetylcholine so that you're not constantly opening the door and letting the signal in. So what happens in Mycenae gravis? So we believe there are three pathophysiological or abnormal things that are happening in MG. So the first is the antibody. So maybe we can go a little bit backwards. So we talked about how we've got our immune system, our army that's sort of gone a little bit haywire. So perhaps due to the thymus, there is a interaction with the B cells, and these are the part of our immune system that make the antibodies. So there are three ways that these antibodies are causing myasthenia. So one is that they actually just block the receptor. So go back to our analogy, you have someone, one of the army folks, just standing in front of the door and saying, nope, you can't put the key in the door, so blocking the receptor. Second is they actually cause the receptor to go inside the muscle and become degraded. So you have less receptors, less doors on the muscle membrane. And the last is that the antibodies actually activate another part of the immune system called the complement system. Again, multiple terminology. And that causes inflammation and uh, degradation of the muscle membrane. So you can think of it as there's uh, the walls with the doors are being damaged. And so sort of coming back to our analogy, we've got the immune system or the antibodies blocking the key to get into the door, the internalization, and then sort of this tank coming up and then just blowing up and causing damage to the wall and the doors. So we kind of thought about the background of what's happening in myasthenia. Bill was kind of lucky because he had a blood test and we saw the abnormality. But there's going to be a subset, and perhaps we have some of these patients in the audience, where the blood test is negative. So we talked about in MG, we can separate it into ocular or generalized. And so in this slide, I just want to highlight that if you have generalized myasthenia gravis, most, most often, 90%, the blood test is going to get to the diagnosis. But if you have disease that's restricted to the eyes, about half of the time, there's not going to be anything in the blood. So how are we going to diagnose your MG? And so here we move to electrophysiological testing. So blood test doesn't show the diagnosis. We can move on to other tests. So one is repetitive nerve stimulation. Not fun, but we put electrodes on your arm, on your neck, even your face, and we give repetitive shocks. And we're trying to see that pathophysiology that we see, um, that we, we believe is happening in Mycena gravis. And then the other test is called single fiber EMG, where we put a needle into the muscle and we're able to look at that nerve muscle connection and see if it's abnormal. So going back to Bill, Bill was pretty lucky 
in that very quickly after the onset of his symptoms, him and his doctor were able to make a diagnosis of MG. But for some of our patients, this journey to you have MG can be quite long, sometimes even years, so awareness becomes really important. But once the diagnosis is made, it's going to be a journey of multiple paths. So it's a very exciting time to be treating myasthenia gravis because we have innovations and lots of novel therapies that have been approved and in the pipeline. And there isn't always going to be one road to the right answer. It's going to be multiple options based on discussion with you and your doctor. So before I give it to Dr. Kane to talk about treatments, I just wanted to just briefly talk about outcome measures. So we talked a little bit about treatment. Dr. Day showed those beautiful videos of the kids getting treatment for SMA. So when it's very clear, you know, we can see it on those videos. But what are the goals of treatment? So I hear different things from my patients, but they say, well, I want to be symptom free or I want to be back to normal. I don't want to be on any medications or I want to be on medications that give me no side effects and I want a cure. So we do different things, we meaning the physicians in clinic, to measure if you've had a treatment response. And you would think as a patient, man, how, why is this so hard? I'm telling you I'm better, I'm stronger. But we need these outcome measures to be able to quantify and say that there is a response, especially when we're studying new therapies. So this is a slide I borrowed from Dr. Mupiti going over all the different scales and this list continues to grow. Where you see the red arrow, these are outcome measures that are more commonly used in mycenia, especially MG clinical trials, which Dr. King is going to go over. And we can see if a patient has responded based on what, they, what the patient tells us. So that is a patient-reported outcome measure. I don't have double vision. My arms are strong. I don't have trouble swallowing. Or it could be a phys physician outcome measure. It's not what the patient's telling me, but it's what I can see and measure on examination. And some outcome measures are mixed. And so quickly, I just want to show you a picture of the MG activity of daily living because this is typically the primary outcome measure of clinical trials. So we take a group of MG patients, we give half of them drug, half of them placebo, and we look at the MG ADL to see is there a difference between the treatment arm and the placebo arm. And you can see there's eight domains going over the symptoms of myasthenia and it's patient reported, it's what the patient tells us. Here in smaller font is the quantitative MG, which is a physician um, uh, examination maneuver. So all those similar domains, eyes, swallowing, strength are now based on what we can see on examination. So in summary, MG is an autoimmune disease. The immune system is blocking nerve and muscle communication. The main symptoms of MG are muscle weakness and fatigue. In the majority of cases, we can make a diagnosis through blood tests, but some patients require electrophysiological testing. And we can use outcome measures to monitor disease. And that part of the field continues to grow as we think of better biomarkers and outcome measures to measure disease response.